right, good afternoon everyone. Welcome to my talk about uh, my uh, little hobby project, uh, tracking the International Space Station with uh, Commodore computers, uh, which uh, is a kind of a strange uh, sentence that you wouldn't think you'd uh, hear. <laughs> but, uh, here we are. Yeah, so uh, yeah, my name is uh, Leif Bloomquist. I know just about everybody in the room. I've been involved in uh, TPUG and uh, you know, the Commodore community on, you know, on and off for like 20 years. So it's uh, always great to see everybody in person. So here's a bit of what I'm going to cover today. So uh, a little bit of history, like how did we get here? Why are we talking about this you know, today? Uh, I'm going to give a little bit of a primer on uh, networking technologies because I'm going to be hitting everybody with a lot of acronyms and just so you have some context for what these acronyms mean. Uh, there's lots of different networking interfaces for the Commodore 64 and other Commodore computers. So I'm going to give a little run through of those. I'll talk a little bit about the FujiNet project. Uh, which is where this uh, ISS tracker comes from, uh, the meatloaf interface, and the uh, demo application for uh, tracking the ISS. And uh, talk a little bit about uh, you know, my contribution to this project was uh, porting the existing tracker code to what's called the Ultimate 64. I don't know what that is. And then uh, just a little bit of uh, thoughts and brainstorming on what's next for you know, this type of project. Sound good? Yes, yes. All right. I hope you're going to explain Meatloaf API. Yes. <laughs> well, following this talk at 2 p.m. is a virtual presentation from Mr. Meatloaf himself, oh. Jamie of Idolpix, and he'll go into way more detail about Meatloaf. I'm just going to do one slide on it. Speaking of Jamie, so some credits. So for this, uh, I actually contributed very little uh, to this. I'm just an enthusiastic uh, user. Uh, so standing on the shoulders of giants, as uh, the saying goes, so most of this was done by uh, Thomas Cherry Holmes. He's the man behind the FujiNet project. And he's developed many demo applications for FujiNet. So there's card games and uh, you know, racing games and uh, yeah, strategy games and chess and this ISS tracker, which really uh, captured my imagination. So I've been uh, doing some work with that. And he's also made versions for the VIC in 64, which I was able to use as a basis. And like I mentioned, uh, Jamie Idolpix will be talking about uh, Meatloaf. And because I'm using the meatloaf uh, interface, I was always pestering with questions at weird hours of the night, saying, hey, how come this API call isn't working? I'm getting a timing error here and all this. I need to help me out and got this into a really workable state. And then finally, Scott Hutter uh, developed a networking library for the Ultimate 64. And this library takes care of all the gross, nitty gritty details of communicating with the Ethernet port. So it just made my job a lot easier. So a little bit of history about, you know, what, like, why am I here? Why am I standing here? So it starts off with 1984. I bought a VIC-20 with my paper route money. <laughs> but even better, my parents said, you know what? If you promise to spend 50% of your time programming the computer, not just playing games, we will buy you a data set for it. It's a little <laughs> so, like, so offer I couldn't refuse, and that was my introductions to programming. But then the universe sent me another message, and I won a Commodore 64 in a raffle draw. Wow. Look at Is that me. you? That's me. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea who the other guy is. That's he is the store manager. Oh, Little so Leaf, look at that, that's fantastic. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so I knew meant to be that, you know, I was really going to dig into, you know, computers and, you know, Commodores in particular. Then a whole bunch of stuff happened. Grew up, went to university, learned to code. Just fast forward, you know, uh, 20 some years. And I ended up at the lead developer as what's called the SSRMS control GUI on the International Space Station. So this is the application that astronauts use to uh, guide the, the Canada Arm 2 into position and send commands and monitor its status. So that was very, very uh, so cool. cool. Oh yeah. my god. It was wow. Yeah, indeed. So you can see there's you know, <laughs> right. already another one. So, you know, direct path already from Big 20 to you know, doing uh, stuff in space. So more stuff happened. <laughs> and again, coming back to the space station, I got to be the project engineer for what's uh, called the logistics and sustaining engineering. So this is a project through the Canadian Space Agency just a giant database storing all the telemetry from the space station and managing and analyzing and all that. So I was kind of the you know, project manager for that. 
I also stopped writing code professionally at this point. I became more of a project manager. You know, Frank and I have been joking. Yeah, no, I just write Jira tickets. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but they're space Jira tickets. That's right. Yeah. Ooh. On your 64. Yeah, and yeah. Well, well, maybe. Yeah. And so these days I'm working as the product manager for there's now a Canada Arm 3. Cool. Uh, this is uh, NASA sending another space station to the moon, and they've asked the Canadian government to contribute another robot arm, because that's what we do. And I'm the product manager for the mission planning tools. Nice. That's awesome. Very cool. Wow. So it's uh, kind of neat. When I heard about this ISS tracker project on the Vic, I'm like, this is great. This brings it full circle from my very humble beginnings on the Vic to uh, all this uh, stuff I've been blessed to be involved in, bring it back together. You are the I... project ma product manager? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So, uh, yeah, so I'm the product owner in the It's not just a pretty face, too. <laughs> <laughs> so that's uh, how we got from you know, Vic to uh, space stations. But also, you know, something I've, everyone who's seen my talks in the past are, uh, you know, one of my hobby interests is hooking commoners up to the internet in interesting ways and doing weird and unusual things with that. But so why? Why are we doing this? I suspect I'm uh, converting to the, uh, preaching to the converted here. <laughs> but, you know, it's, but it's worth uh, reflecting a bit on how, how we got here. So, of course, you know, commoner users always had a rich online experience with uh, early uh, services such as Quantum Link. Bulletin board uh, systems, and we have a lot of nostalgia for those you know, online uh, days. Commodore Gaming's always had a strong social aspect, so how many of us had uh, you know, gaming parties in our basements, bring all our friends over from you know, grade 8, and chips and pizza, and play Mule all night? But uh, <laughs> yeah, now you know, we're blessed in Toronto, there's all these Commodore users around. Now we just add beer to that. Oh, yeah, all exactly. We <laughs> yeah. Well, and we're also adding the online dimension, like can we play games? You know, you know. Uh, with uh, friends around the world and still keep that same uh, social connection. Uh, internet capability on an 8-bit, it's just a fun technical challenge in and of itself. Also, we can leverage all the stuff that's coming out for Arduino and Internet of Things. You know, with a little bit of uh, electrical uh, trickery, you can connect all this stuff to your Commodore 64. And finally, this is uh, getting into uh, where we are. <laughs> it, there's this Japanese uh, philosophy called the Shindogu, called the whimsical, or it's the unuseless invention. You come up with something that sounds great, and then when you think about it, wait a minute, that's pointless. Why would you do that? And then, but that's awesome. But it's, <laughs> and the uh, the more subtle you can make that line, the more satisfying and hilarious it is. So, uh, <laughs> so doing these type of hobby projects really appeals to uh, to me and the Shindo group. Is, is that a splash card on this face? So Sorry, what is, that? what is that on this face? Yeah, it's a splash card. Splash so you card. don't get noodles in your hair. <laughs> <laughs> well, you don't want noodles in your hair, right? So you. Clearly, there's a, a, a need to solve yes. this problem. But it's ridiculous. <laughs> there is one I'm eating, Robin. Trust me. There's definitely a need for me to have one. Okay. So, so I'm going to be throwing a lot of acronyms at you, so I'm going to do a little uh, orientation on uh, networking technology. So anyone who works in IT, I apologize. This is distilled down <laughs> to the absolute minimum that I can cover in five minutes. Well, you'll hear this term uh, called the TCP IP stack. And we call it a stack because different technologies stack on each other like lasagna. You start at the lowest, lowest layer, uh, which is the physical layer. This is the actual cable. This is the actual radio <coughs> frequencies. And then you move up one to the internet protocol, which gives some details on how the data needs to get from A to B. You move up one more, and now you're into what's called the transport layer, where you're actually moving data around. And I'll get into that a little more. And then at the top level is your application layer. This is where you're actually doing useful stuff. This is your web browsing, this is your email, this is you know, remote logins, things like that. So I'm going to start at the bottom and dig into these a little more. So Ethernet, uh, like I said, it's become the, it's become the uh, de facto standard uh, for uh, networking. And this talks about the lowest layer, what is the lowest level of how you connect multiple computers together. So cables, frequencies, you know, raw zeros and ones. But uh, fun fact for the Commodore folks, uh, so uh, Ethernet has a code called the uh, Ethernet Organizational Unique Identifier, and Commodore had one. So if you program your devices to use this code, 008010, 
which matches the product number of one of their modems. Your Commodore devices show up as a Commodore device when you're using modern network analysis tools. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> Well, I'm spoofing my Macs now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so moving one level up, now we have the internet protocol. And this is, uh, again, it provides information about where you're getting, where you want the data to go. What's its source, what's its destination, what type of data is within it. And it doesn't do much on its own. The data is contained within the next layer. So, uh, everyone good on IP so far? You're know, all getting a networking degree in five minutes. Sorry? Well, yeah, this is, yeah, so there's two different versions, you know, version four and version six. Version four is what we're all using. Now you've probably heard at home, like, you know, 192.168. You know, blah, blah, blah. Uh, whereas IP, uh, IPv6 is a nice long string of 128 bits, and it's enough that you can give an IP address to every square centimeter on the uh, planet Earth. Mm -hmm. Just in case. That lasts for a while. Yeah, no, we won't run to those. Things. All right, pause for a while. <laughs> yeah, everyone's got it. Yeah, so the joke's over. Okay, so one, one level up, you're in uh, UDP, so this is user data gram protocol. This is the simplest way of sending data <clears throat> across the internet. You In your code, you collect it into a packet and say, you know, Go, you know, be free. And it's like sending a postcard. You just send it off, and you have no idea if it's going to get there, if it's going to get in order, in the right order. It's just fire and forget. So, yeah, so I could tell you a joke about UDP, but you might not get it. <laughs> 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 and uh, so it's a very simple protocol. So, this is something that our uh, you know, beloved Commodore machines can do with the, you know, with the right hardware. And uh, you know, a little bit of uh, yeah, a little bit of software magic. But to do something really useful, you need the TCP, which is Transport Control Protocol. And the analogy here is that it's a phone call. You create a connection, and then you stream the data between the two computers. And it guarantees that the data will get there. It's in the right order, and it handles all of that, all of those messy details. Uh, so this is where you want a reliable connection, like uh, strategy games, you know, email. You know, web, you know, chat applications will all use TCP. And the 8-bits can do this, but it's a little more involved in terms of resources and coding and so on. So once you've got TCP, now you can start to get into really interesting applications. You get into HTTP, the Hypertext Transfer Protocol. So as TechTarget calls it, HTTP is the set of rules for transferring files such as text, images, sound, video, and other multimedia over the web. So in other words, it's the language of the web. So everything you're doing on World Wide Web in your browser uses HTTP and its big brother, HTTPS, in some way. So again, it's built on top of TCP. So once you have access to HTTP on a Commodore, there's some really cool possibilities that open up. You could do a simple web browser. You can download files. So on the Commodores, we use PRG for standalone files or a D64, et cetera, et cetera, for disk images. And you can now access those directly from the web. And also gives you access to something called JSON files, which I'll talk about quite a bit. So JSON is the JavaScript object notation. So when you're downloading one of these files over HTTP, it doesn't actually have to be a file. It can be a piece of data that is generated on the fly dynamically. So again, Wikipedia calls it an open standard file format. A data interchange format uses human-readable text to store and transmit data objects. It gets its name from JavaScript, uh, but it's now usable in almost any modern programming language. It's relatively easy for humans and computers to understand, even our uh, little 8 bits. And the data can be dynamic, so you uh, it can be something that's updated in real time, and every time you read it, you get a fresh a view of what that data uh, is describing. And another acronym uh, that uh, you'll hear a lot is uh, API, so Application Programming Interface. And that's just the way you access uh, this data. So I'll talk a little more about JSON you know, towards the end. That's the networking overview. Everyone good? But everyone asleep? Wow. Thank you. <laughs> so a little more history. 
So, uh, so my, some of you might know this. Uh, so Adam Dunkels, back in 2002, created the final Eastern End cartridge. And the name was a riff on the final cartridge, which was one of these utility cartridges for the 64. And this was, uh, I think this was part of his PhD thesis. And he made a fully functional design of an Ethernet cartridge for the 64. You would plug it in. And he invented something called the micro IP stack. So a TCP IP stack, which we all know what it is now, that crams into you know, just a few tens of kilobytes, which is amazing. And he, just to demonstrate it, he wrote, you can see a screenshot here, the Contiki operating system that ran on the Commodore 64. And so this had a web browser, it had a web server, it had Telnet, it had audio streaming all running on the 64, just to show what the possibilities were, which was very, very cool. And that began the era of the internet-enabled Commodore 64. <laughs> <laughs> so from this, people uh, wrote all kinds of cool applications for this. They made games and file transfer and uh, you know, email clients and ways to image disks over the network and so on. Uh, but the, uh, I wanted to take it to the next level again. Commodore was very, you know, was always known for its gaming, like its rich gaming uh, library. Uh, so I made a few games that I presented at past World of Commodore, so I won't go into much detail. But there's, you know, artillery duel, you know, a little you know, the classic shoot at each other over the hill, a, a car racing game, net racer, vortex, a space shoot 'em up, and the one I'm working on once in a while now, you know, Dungeon of the Rogue Daemon, which is a little bit of a networking fun mm -hmm. for those of you who are in the know. And I won't spend much time on this, but you can download them all at this so website. Ready grabbing this phone? Yeah, I'm grabbing my phone to get the URL. <laughs> no, my phone's out of battery. Okay, I'll, I'll send it to you. Okay. Yeah, so just schema64.h.io. Yeah. So after the final Ethernet, you know, there's now a plethora of networking options. There are so many ways to connect your Commodore to the internet, most of which are not compatible with each other in any way. Hmm. So on the expansion port, we have again the final Ethernet, and there's modern reproductions of it, the RRNet and the 64 NIC Plus, which uh, Jim Brain is selling over in the, in the other room. But also, uh, so I'll jump over to the user port. So the user port is where you would traditionally plug a modem in to the Commodore 64, and so people have created Wi-Fi modems. So it looks like a modem, acts like a modem, you know, smells like a modem, but it's actually going out over Wi-Fi. And then the newest addition to all of this is our, our ones that run over the IEC port, and I'll talk specifically about the, the meatloaf uh, for a couple slides. And so we have all these options, which leads you to this. <laughs> <laughs> what we're just talking about we this last just, night. <laughs> this very joke just last night. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so a little more uh, details on these. So, uh, uh, so user port modems, they, collect, they connect to the user <coughs> port, and this pretends to be an old school dial-up modem. So, so instead of typing ATDT <coughs> and a phone number, you do ATDT and a website address or, a, or an IP address. These are usable on any Commodore machine with a user port, so the VIC, the 64, the 128, and even the PET if you modify the wiring a little bit. So all your old terminal software, CCGMS, Novaterm, all the terminal programs we used back in the day will still work. They don't know they're talking to Wi-Fi. They work exactly the same as before. And in theory, you could even host a Wi-Fi bulletin board system because they'll accept income calls too. So it does have some limitations. You're limited to 2,400 bits per second unless you do some uh, you know, sort of non-standard uh, hacks to bump it up to 9,600 or higher. And so there's lots of examples. There is the retro rewind Wi-Fi modem. Yeah. I would try. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wouldn't get it. WIC 64, you know, Zy modem. This is a version specifically for the pet called the Stupid Pet Tricks, uh, which is really fun. Doing the internet stuff on your pets is just wild. So and many others. Excuse me. Do you want to wait on questions till the end? Uh, no, feel free to. Well, good. Then why why was it limited to twenty four hundred bits per oh. second? I don't know. You was it just? Are you telling me? Is it C sixty? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, was it the C sixty four CPU or the the it was hard? The, the, it was the uh, because the uh, if I understand the uh, specifics correctly, 
there was a bug in the CIA chip that did the interfacing, mm -hmm. so they had to do all the RS-232 protocol by hand in the C64 mm -hmm. kernel, mm -hmm. which, which, which just did, yeah. killed your uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Not a bug. Not a bug. It's just no UART chip in the machine. Well, you have to bit bang it anyway. Yeah, yeah. They, they, yeah. Bit, they basically emulate the UART chip yep. to save save money. Mm -hmm. Okay, so a <laughs> limitation as opposed to that. Okay, save oh, money. Enough. Oh yeah, well that was the, 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 the that was the, well that's saving money is how we got computer for the you know, masses, yeah, not for the classes, classes, right? That's how you know little me with a uh, paper route could afford one of these machines as opposed to like a two thousand dollar IBM that had no colors. <laughs> <laughs> So on the expansion port, uh, so this connects to the uh, expansion port, uh, cartridge port. Uh, it'll, these will also work on a VIC-20 if you have the right adapter. Again, Jim Brain sells an adapter to do exactly that. One limitation here is your TCP IP stack is running inside the machine. So you have limited memory already, and a big chunk of that is being used by the TCP IP stack. You need special software to communicate with these cards, usually written specifically for that interface. But the bandwidth is insanely fast, 10 megabits per second. So I've got to you can fill this just the Relatively three, fast, uh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Five one hundredths of a second. Oh, yeah, once we get gigabit Ethernet, then we're yeah, right, right. <laughs> so uh, so some examples here, final Ethernet, or an at 64 NIC, there's another clone called the FB net. And these are all based on the same chip called the CS8900, so they do actually work with each other at least. So software that's written for one will work for any of the others. And this has kind of been the de facto standard for 8-bit Commodore for years. A couple of uh, weird interfaces I'll mention. Uh, so the Ultimate 64, uh, which I have one. So these are hardware re-implementations of uh, these machines with an FPGA, which is a field uh, programmable gate array. So this is a magical chip that you can flash to emulate you know, almost any other chip. So in the case of the Ultimate 64, it's taking the place of the 6510 CPU and all the other uh, support chips. Uh, Mega 65 is a project to uh, make a reasonably authentic reproduction of the Commodore 65. So both of these machines are you know, based on FPGAs and the, uh, I just realized the typo, and uh, so the TCIP IP stack on these is running inside the FPGA, but outside the 8-bit memory space, so it frees up all your RAM and all your processor and everything. You do need special software for this, again, written specifically for these interfaces. There's libraries to take care of the dirty work, but they're not compatible with the RNF, and they're not compatible with each other, so yeah, more, more incompatibilities everywhere. Yeah. And the bandwidth is also 10 megabits per second, but the interface is a little, it's one byte at a time. So it's uh, not as fast as the RNet, but... Uh, one byte? Well, you, know, you have a tight loop that's saying, give me all the data as it comes in. So it's still pretty fast, but not as fast as the RNet, which is directly memory mapped. Mm -hmm. Okay, how's everyone doing? Any questions? <laughs> I know I'm good last the information. Okay, a uh, little side chat here about the FujiNet. So we're going to talk about some of the other uh, 8 bits here. So the FujiNet is uh, it's a multi-peripheral emulator and Wi-Fi network for many different vintage computers. So this was uh, targeting Atari, you know, Apple, Coleco, Atom, and uh, that's where, where it got its start. So this allows vintage computers that don't have enough processor power to handle a TCIP IP stack, you know, to gain access to the internet. There's lots of example programs, so there's card games, like I mentioned, you know, strategy games, something called Plato Term, which is a whole news information port, uh, portal. The ISS tracker was written for this, and a lot more. So these example programs are available on GitHub, so anyone can uh, download the source code, see how it works, build their own, or uh, improve on it. So we've got the, there's versions for the Atari, Apple, Coleco, and then the Commodore version is called the Meatloaf. So, just talk a bit about meatloaf. Oh, this is a big slide with lots of uh, text, <laughs> but uh, I don't want to steal too much of uh, Jamie's uh, thunder here. But the meatloaf is a really neat interface. It's based on the very common ESP32 system on a chip. You can build one yourself under twenty dollars <coughs> a part, and it connects to the IEC port, which means it acts like a disk drive or a printer. You know, anything that runs off of that uh, connection to the back of the sixty-four. So this will work on 
any Commodore machine with one of those ports. So you have the VIC, 64, 128, plus 4, and so on. And you don't need any special drivers or special software. You just use the, the regular load commands, the regular kernel commands, to access this device mm -hmm. and resources on the internet as though they were files on a floppy disk. Mm -hmm. And you can program it in basic. Oh. So you can do 10, open 15, comma, 8, comma, 15, comma, URL, and it takes care of the rest. So you can download anything. You can download D64s, PRGs, and now coming back to JSON files. So you can access this uh, dynamic data either from basic or assembler or you know, C, uh, C programs. And because uh, you know, JSON's a little complex, uh, it does have a built-in JSON parser. So that just offloads just a little bit more of the work you know, from the, uh, you know, the Commodore. Is, is that a new addition to Meatloaf, or was that always there? Uh, that's, that actually comes from the FujiNet side. Yeah. Oh, yeah, okay. it's always been there. But if the API is a little obscure, okay. but it's, uh, yeah, it's in there. See the slide on standards? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> So, uh, but if you remember, you know, loading a game on your, uh, you know, on your 1541 load, you know, string comma eight, and then you sit for minutes and minutes while the program loads, you are, with the meatloaf, you do have that same uh, bandwidth limitation because it's coming over the IEC bus, which is a stunning uh, 400 bytes per second. But applications like, or utilities like uh, Jiffy DOS can increase that uh, quite dramatically. Yeah, we've got Jiffy Dust in the back corner, by the way, if anyone wants to Yeah, uh, though Meatloaf doesn't support it just yet, but it's Jamie's work on it. Jamie's yes. working on a fast loop for that? Uh, Jamie is. I have So I don't want to steal too much of this thunder. I already did a whole slide. Jamie's going to be a whole doing a whole talk after this one, too, yeah. going into all the details of the, the Meatloaf. Okay, any questions on Meatloaf, standards? So now we have all the elements we need to bring together to tracking the space station. Mm -hmm. So we have this demo application, which was written by uh, Tom, Thomas Cherry Holmes for the FujiNet project, and he also worked on the Commodore versions. And the Meatloaf has the rest of what we need. We have the IEC interface to make it easy to interface to. It takes care of the TCP IP stack. It takes care of the HTTP interface, and it has a built-in JSON parser. And then NASA provides a JSON API with the ISS's current location, and it looks just like that. So it's just some simple text with latitude and longitude, and every time you refresh it, it gives you the very latest. So this means you can do this on an unexpanded VIC-20. So a VIC-20 with 5K of RAM can, can get dynamic uh, JSON data off the internet. Because a lot of the heavy lifting is done by the meatloaf, and then the VIC-20 does the rest. In fact, the uh, application that's running on the VIC is only 2,791 bytes. Hmm. And that's not even assembler, that's written in C. So that includes the map, and it includes the, uh, you know, some parts of the C standard library. So very, very uh, tight, compact uh, code. And there's a bit of uh, remaining RAM, uh, also this is set up as a cartridge ROM, so you would plug, you know, you'd load it into the cartridge memory, plug it in, and it would just uh, appear. There's a little bit of RAM left over for temporary variables. So all the application does is, does is pull this JSON API from NASA, you know, it parses through, finds latitude, longitude, updates the pet screen here that Thomas made, and uh, just repeats every 10 seconds. Yeah. Yes. Ooh, <laughs> uh, so my contribution to all of this was to uh, adapt this to the Ultimate 64. So this is again the FPGA based uh, version of the Commodore 64, which gives you a lot more. It has uh, built in Ethernet, you can overclock it to 48 megahertz, and it has its own proprietary, but fortunately well documented Ethernet interface. So that gives you your TCP and UDP. Uh, so I took the uh, FujiNet version and adapted it to the Ultimate 64. So Scott Hutter created a library to handle all the nitty gritty details. Uh, I implemented a very crude uh, HTTP interface and a very crude uh, JSON parser to look at that data object that comes back and finds the data we want from the packet and pull it out. 
And, but the logic otherwise is exactly the same. It holds the JSON API, updates the screen on the Ultimate 64. It's actually a sprite. So, uh, and just repeat every 10 seconds. It's the great over Moscow. It, uh, everyone's been making that. <laughs> that, that, yeah. that, 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 that. <laughs> but yeah, you can picture that, like, you know, take the, the map from Raid right over Moscow and have a real time yeah. data. Yeah. 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 And so the code for this I've got uh, up on uh, GitHub if anyone wants to take a look. So this map, in this case, uh, modify character set? Uh, this is a high-res bitmap image. Okay. It's actually the official uh, uh, map from Wikipedia that's been scaled down and adapted to the Commodore uh, display. You should say in Holman 64, is that the board or do you use the card too? Uh, this will also work with the Ultimate uh, 1541 cartridge. cartridge yeah. And you mean the entire ISS tracking code's all available? Yes. Oh, good. Okay. Yeah. So now that we're able to do things like this, you know, ISS is kind of a, kind of a cool application that has a lot of uh, personal meaning to me. But we have access to JSON APIs, not just any JSON API, but every JSON API that's out there that could be useful. And I want to just uh, throw a couple of uh, ideas at you. So there's lots of really interesting JSON APIs here. There's like the 10 most kind of interesting ones I just came up with quickly. So there's weather and news. So you can make a weather app, a news app that's pulling JSON APIs from the weather network or what have you display that. Stock prices. So there's <coughs> APIs for accessing stock prices. You can have a real-time stock ticker on your Commodore, you know, running along the bottom with the logo <laughs> flying around. Makes you cry every time you see your stock price. Yes. <laughs> uh, there's something called Cheerlights. One of the other uh, hobby projects I've done is uh, uh, Cheerlights is a really neat uh, Internet of Things application where it's for synchronizing Christmas lights. They have an API where you can say, hey, hey Cheerlights, I'm feeling blue. And it'll turn the Cheerlights uh, color to blue. And every Christmas tree in the world that's on this network will turn blue. And then someone else will answer back with red, and you can just watch the colors change in your Christmas tree. Wow. <laughs> but it gets more ridiculous. So, <laughs> <laughs> so we have to tell the United States government has a, has a JSON API that gives you real time earthquake data. Is there one for Amber Alerts? Like uh, emergency weather alerts and stuff to help get our. Possibly. The earthquake yeah, one? Possibly. How about lightning strikes? Yes. yes. Yeah, there is one? Uh, oh, good. <laughs> but, you know, because we're, you know, we're in the Shindoku uh, territory here, there's API for Chuck Norris. <laughs> 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 there were a number of Chuck Norris games for the 64 and the Vic, so uh, there's... Uh, <laughs> That's uh, wonderful. Uh, also, uh, you know, to be a little more useful, geolocation. You can get your computer's your own computer's latitude and longitude based on IP. So something I want to add to the ISS tracker is have a little pin showing your current city. And then you can get a notification when the ISS is about to fly over. And whether or not Chuck Norris approves. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <coughs> Told you he was really smart. <laughs> and of course, you know, there's one for the space station location, which is being used by this application. And there's hundreds and hundreds more. This is just uh, what I uh, came up with. I monitor stock levels on my 64 using JSON. <laughs> yeah, yeah that's maybe, that sounds like a great bumper sticker. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah. <laughs> we do it because we can't for no other reason. Yeah, so thousands more. So how could we use this on our uh, Commodore? So I just threw up a whole bunch of ideas uh, here. So we use weather apps, you know, but you know, for games, I'm always uh, focused on the gaming. What if there was a shared high score table? What if, as you loaded up the game, it came up with here, here are the world high scores for you know, the game you're playing. And uh, so I've talked about HTTP GET for retrieving information. In theory, I haven't tested this, you can do the other way, which is the HTTP uh, put, post put. or uh, put. Yeah. And so when you, you know, get a new high score, have that pushed to a server somewhere, and then everyone else will see, yeah, hey, Frank got uh, 10 million in uh, uh, Pac-Man. But uh, it's you know real time uh, real time feeds. So uh, you know what if you got notifications of new releases and games? So like all from your Commodore, come up with a list of here's what's new this week from the demo scene. You know who made it and click on it and have it download it and see it on your real hardware right away. So a list of current players like multiplayer games, 
Yeah. Like, who's waiting in the lobby? Who's waiting to play this? This could all be accessible to you. And you could dynamically grab all kinds of things, so new content for your games. Like, say, there's a new character released. Oh, no, we're bringing DLC now to the content. Oh, well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, how are we finding you? Uh, one thing five. Oh, 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 awesome. And uh, Greg still, uh, Greg is still here. So, what if you could do patches and upgrades, you know, libraries and content for something like C sixty four OS? So yeah, check file, check for new version, and we would just do a JSON call saying that you're on one point oh five, newest version one point oh seven. Should be done by the end of the day, right, Greg? <laughs> <laughs> And so at the bottom, your idea here. So I'd yeah. love to hear ideas from folks. Ryan's hand went two, right two up. Two ideas. Yes. Uh, luggage tracker, right? <laughs> yeah, that's our yes. last mm -hmm. luggage, uh, Apple ID tags or whatever. Um, and it might be cool uh, if um, there's a project for the identification of Commodore 64s so where you register your Commodore 64. Oh, with the serial numbers? Yeah. 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 Might be cool to see where they are. Like around, all, different all different around different the world, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Leave. This yes, will work with the 1541 Ultimate. Yes, cartridge. Yes, I'll have to get a copy because I'm on the network over on there. Okay. Yeah. I guess. So. Yeah. Yeah. You got it. Thanks. I just thought of this idea. Sure. Call queue uh, for a call center. Just sit there and grab and see what it really is. Calls and have to write something. Pop up. You're like, what's with the 64? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and have it, you know, flash, you know, and, or have a you know, sprite come in and say, shh, it's not your ball. Mm -hmm. That's so good. Yeah. No. Okay. <laughs> yes, no, no, I was just saying, that doesn't sound silly. That sounds good to me. <laughs> what about, what about a, since it's getting close to Christmas, what about Santa Cracker? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 So, codes up on GitHub. Yeah. Get, uh, get have at it. Yeah. Have at it. <laughs> you already have the map. <laughs> How do you get Santa to show up? I think they know somebody in Google can get that. I will. Uh, I will look at your code because I'd like. It just applies the Santa API. Nor at yes, Google. We do have. Uh, we do have some limited support for other application layer in our Wi-Fi mode. But I'm gonna look at your code and see if we can uh, incorporate it so that you actually use the Wi-Fi mode. Yeah, that'd be cool. What about us on a peak? Could, we, could you do stuff with that in this? Oh, sorry. What, what do you mean? mean? SNMP. You do like on the on the ESP itself. I'm not sure if the commoner. Yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> like use up all the memory. Oh, the yeah. just trying to run the library. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I didn't you know, know how big it was. So. Yeah, quite big. Yeah. Okay. Never mind. But you said this works on the Wi-Fi two plus. Is it? It does. Using the network and through the IEC for Fuji then? So or for yeah. So again, yeah, there's two interfaces yeah. Yeah. which are not compatible with each other. So if you were yeah. using so on. For the ultimate 1541, uh, you have you would have a choice. You could either use the FujiNet or the Meatloaf over the IEC port, or use the built-in Ethernet port on the ultimate 1541. So I have a more generic philosophical question. The JSON, you said, you know, it's all in English. We've seen a lot of this all English language interfaces these days, but. The, you know, a language version of, of an interface versus a binary version is so much bigger, so much extra overhead. Do you see inherent values in having it be in an actual language that people can read versus speed of transmission if it was done in binary? Um, yeah, I mean, the, if you're trying to squeeze every last little bite out, that's what you know, we did in the yeah, embedded days, you know, uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, but yeah, I think that needle shifted a bit just for ease of uh, debugging. You just look at the pack and see exactly. Is that what, what it is, is for you? Ease of debugging. Yeah, and uh, and of course you could make the JSON very compact. Yeah, there's uh, I know for JavaScript there's minifiers where you, it actually takes the code and compresses it. To, yeah, it's, it's still it's there. still yeah. ASCII text that moves out all the extraneous <coughs> spaces along with variable characters and so on. Yeah. You could do something similar with JSON. That's probably a thing, but I haven't. Probably get close to uh, binary parity that way. I mean, I, you know, at Google, we use stuff like JSON a lot, mm -hmm. and and for huge, huge, huge JSON entries, and and like coming up to the limit. I don't know what the limit of, of JSON is off the top of my head, but I've heard discussions that sometimes they create packets that are all the way out at the character limit of it. It it 
I, I, that's and, insanity. Just thinking about that is insanity. Yeah, I mean, part of the argument is, well, the internet's so fast now, it doesn't matter anymore. We send text, we send binary, it doesn't matter, but it still feels like it matters to me. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you. Yeah, and then the, uh, but also with JSON, you don't have to necessarily ingest the entire thing. Yeah, you can you parse know, it. Just read through a chunk of it. Ah, uh, got it. Parse, uh, through it. No, you're not as efficient, but that way you get it past any memory constraints. Or some sort of a seek thing saying, give me the JSON starting at this mm -hmm. offset. Well, it could be worse. It could be XML. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It could be yeah. Yeah. So good It point. could also be yeah. the SN1. Oh, God. Boy, I don't even know what that is. <laughs> Count yourself lucky. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Greg. So the meatloaf does the JSON decoding for you, though? Yes. So uh, what, what do you, uh, you're gonna, I, mean, I don't want you to give away Jamie's uh, presentation, but like, what, what do you have to do to, to like, so you can Oh yeah, so you some key yeah. just of, of yeah. So you make you make two requests. Say here's the uh, here's the URL to the JSON object I want to look at, and then you make a second request saying pull out this data object for me. Yeah, or this uh, sub go with the path. You just provide a path. Yeah, so it's a path saying value. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, so in that case, you don't actually have to parse the JSON right in, inside. Yeah, so I didn't. Right. So yeah, I didn't get into the JSON in detail, but you see there's an inherent hierarchy. So it's not just a big blob of data you can structure and say this is encapsulated within this and within this. So it's uh, much easier to uh, zoom in on the exact uh, data you want. So and it's real easy to do on the ESP, which is what they're using, like really easy to do. So you just do that um, from basic using like uh, like custom commands on channel 15 or something that... Yep, precisely. Okay. Oh yeah, I see, see a lot. Oh, question. I feel I'm surprised no one has brought up uh, ChatGPT. Well, uh, we'll see if uh, Jamie says. Okay. About that. I'll, I'll yeah. <laughs> there are BBSs that now have ChatGPT built in. Them. Mm -hmm. GPT and the Sam speech sense together would be like my childhood dream. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah shades of uh, Eliza. If anyone. Uh, Eliza. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, I'm, I'm thinking. I'm thinking. Uh, what's it? The the image. The image generator part Dolly? Of, yeah, Dolly or okay. Stable Diffusion producing uh, producing sprites on the fly. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah, That's lots of, screens. Yeah, yeah, lots of cool possibilities here. I think we're just uh, scratching the surface for uh, the fun, interesting, uh, unuseless uh, applications for our Commodore and the net. Why do we do it? Because we can. Yeah, That's can. right. <laughs> no other reason. Because we can. <laughs> Okay, I'll leave it at that. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, oh, that's pretty good. <laughs>